Hi, my name is Sarah Fontenot, and I'm a health law educator out of Texas. Uh, briefly on my background, I was a nurse for six plus years in a variety of areas, neuro neurosurge, gen gen oncology, nursing education, when I went to law school. When I first got out of law school, I did medical malpractice defense work, and then shortly thereafter had an opportunity to teach. I taught hospital law and public health law at Yale Medical School in the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health for two years, at which point in time my husband and I moved our family, our little family, from New Haven, Connecticut to a tiny little town in central Texas called Fredericksburg. Since then, that was 1994, pretty, pretty closely after that, I became the faculty member at Trinity University, adjunct faculty, at Trinity University in San Antonio in the Department of Healthcare Administration. So I am teaching graduate students uh, who are working towards their MHA. For the most part, they will become hospital administrators. Since that time, since I arrived in Texas, I've also taught extensively for Texas Medical Association, Southern Medical Association, Arkansas Medical Society, a number of national uh, groups such as ACHE and uh, MGMA, et cetera, but uh, been my great privilege now for a number of years to do programming through ACPE, which is what brings me here to you today. The program is one of my favorites, and it is called a Healthcare Reform, a Spectator's Guide. And it is meant to be make you an educated observer as we go through this whole very interesting and critical moment in the future of healthcare in America. So by way of introduction, um, I want this to be a 10,000 foot view. The goal of the program is not to argue for or against reform. I am confident you all have your own opinion. And your opinion is valid and nothing I say is gonna cause you to change your opinion. I promise that. But whether you're for it or against it, I want you to understand some of the background, some of the law behind it, and some of the sheer political shenanigans which just make it, if nothing else, more entertaining to watch this whole process, as important as it is. I don't mean to make light of the, the, the topic, but the process really has been kind of interesting. So I want to provide you with an objective review of the process, the issues, and some expectations of what we're likely to see in this battle as it goes onward um, in this very heated political climate. So again, you have an opinion about healthcare reform. This is what was on the GOP's website. I love this chart. That may be how it looks to you. Or it could be the opposite, which is like a treasure chest of reform. Whether you're for it or against it, again, my goal is to show you some of the very interesting um, jurisdictional, legal, and political things behind the whole uh, conflict as it plays out. In all fairness, it is a fiendishly complicated bill, and we all know that. I, I like this quote, the problem for the Obama administration is health care reform is fiendishly complicated because the health care system is fiendishly complicated. It's not politically feasible to tear up the system and build it again, although that was discussed in the fall of 2009. But instead, you have to build on the system that you have, and when you try to build on a fiendishly complicated system, you have fiendishly complicated reforms. So we all understand. It is a very, it's a tough nut to crack. Again, whether we think they should be cracking that nut or not, that's, that's absolutely your call. But when I teach my students about this law, what I call the, the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, I just call it, it's a greatest hits album. Every idea that has been floated by every administration, Republican, Democrat, blue, red, purple, and they put them all in this, um, in this same law sometimes a different name. So for example, when we talk about accountable care, hello, that is pay for performance. Or bundled payments, many of you remember capitated care, uh, very, very similar. Meaningful use, it's all about the paperless health care system. It's actually in many ways similar to the Patient Safety Quality Improvement Act back in 2005. Medical homes, I'm sorry, you like them or you don't like them, but that is really similar to a closed model HMO back in the 90s. Fraud and abuse, I know it's a huge part of the Affordable Care Act, but heaven knows it wasn't invented there. We have had 
every administration has been going after the holy grail of finding all the money that's being lost through fraud, fraud and abuse. And in, the, in more recent years, we've had rack and rack attacks and mix, which are the Medicaid integrity uh, uh, collectors. So we've had a investigator, excuse me, but we've had a lot of action for years and years about fraud and abuse. Um, moratorium on physician-owned hospitals has gotten a lot of heat in this bill, and I understand that touches a very raw nerve. However, again, that did not start with uh, the Affordable Care Act either. That actually started back in 2003 through a number, of, it's had a series of different acts in that nature. So basically what we have here with the Affordable Care Act is a bunch of ideas, um, some of them with years and years of traction, all compiled together. So it's not as monolithic as it may appear. But anyhow, so I just want you to hold on to that thought. It is a con conglomeration of a lot of good ideas or bad ideas, depending on your opinion. But there's really not that much new in it. It's just a new packaging in many cases. Again, hold on to that thought. So what I want to talk about very quickly is the status of the court challenges to this act. What's the score? Where we are right now at the day of the recording is we're pretty equal on the score, but I want you to know how I'm scoring for and against because we have had a lot of district courts weigh in on this, but what we're really waiting for is the appellate courts. So a little constitution here, but we have appellate court systems. We have appellate court districts, and you'll see the map there from, uh, from this, actually it's a federal website, and they establish these uh, appellate courts to channel from the district courts, obviously, to the Supreme Court. And yes, it is the appellate courts that are a pretty much split decision right now on whether or not the Affordable Care Act is or is not constitutional. Um, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals came out in um, August saying that in a, is again a recent ruling of the US Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit has declared it was unconstitutional and that they uh, which is uh, specifically the issue is whether or not there can be an individual mandate to purchase insurance so the decision conflicts with the sixth court which had gone the other way that was just in late June Everyone at the time of this was basing on the Fourth Circuit because these appellate courts, which you need to understand, is they are all equal. The country is divided up into these different regions, and so we have a number of different circuits that are weighing in on the same issue, and it's not that they're invalid. There's just no winners and losers. It's kind of like a baseball score is why I used that, the, the picture on the last slide. So right now, we're kind of, everyone was waiting for the Fourth Circuit, and as was expected, the Fourth Circuit went the other way, again, voting in favor of the law. It was kind of interesting. This came, it just came out in September, September 9th. But the Fourth Circuit was expected to be in favor of the law or go with the administration on this. But they actually, um, the reason for the decision was what was unexpected. They, they threw out the... Uh, um, the, uh, the, they threw out the challenge on technic technical grounds. Um, for those of you who are legal geeks, uh, it was a standing ground, whether there was a standing um, on a general tax appeal. Uh, it's various different standing and jurisdictional issues. Anyhow, so it was not unexpected that the fourth would kind of weigh out, again, the current challenges in the appellate court. All of that, and not to take away from the appellate courts, because they obviously are hugely important in our legal system, but all of this has to go to the Supreme Court. So in all, with all due respect to Kate Smith, who, in, who the phrase was invented for, you know what they say, it ain't over until the fat lady sings, and that's the Supreme Court. So what the Supreme Court has to do, by the way, must do in our system, when you have equal federal appellate courts on the same issue, having diametrically opposed issues, that must be something that the, 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 the Supreme Court is almost undoubtedly going to take a case of that nature and for sure will take a case of this importance, especially given that we have so many different appellate decisions with diametrically opposed results. So that's where we are right now. We're waiting for the Supreme Court. So, and, and again, I want you to hold on to that thought. So I'm just putting some thoughts in your head right now. So again, it's a, it's a greatest hits album. And right now, although people think they're winning or losing, we're really on hold because we really need to get to the Supreme Court before we have a definitive answer on this law. 
What's the issue? Now bear with me, don't panic. This is only going to be very, very quick. But the issue comes down to a very, very important component of the Constitution, which is the Commerce Clause. Article 1 of the U.S. Constitution is where all the powers of Congress, uh, it's about setting up Congress and giving authority to Congress, and specifically Section 8 delineates very specific powers that uh, the states, all the states gave to the federal government as part of the constitutional process. And very importantly, as you'll see there highlighted, um, one of the issues that each of the sovereign states gave up was regulation of commerce. So it's the Commerce Clause that gets is, is the question, again, specific to the individual mandated by, by an insurance. I should have said this before. I made an assumption. The 99% the of the uh, Affordable Care Act is not being challenged. It is this component that specifically is being challenged because there's a reason to challenge it under the Commerce Clause or an argument to challenge it. Uh, the rest of it really is, is not being challenged, although, again, it gets in some technicalities about whether the opinion's severable or not. But just know that this is the issue. Does the Commerce Clause give the United States Congress to pass a law requiring all of us to buy insurance? So the Commerce Clause regulates insurance. In addition to the Commerce Clause, later in Section 8, there is a very, very famous thing called the Necessary and Proper Clause. And what that says is Congress may make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into power all the other powers that they were just given. Traditionally and historically, the combination of those two clauses in Article 1, Section 8, the Commerce Clause, I have an uh, opportunity, I have the right to regulate commerce, interstate commerce, etc., and I have the right to do anything necessary to execute those powers. The combination of those two clauses have been used many, many times by Supreme Courts throughout our history to justify certain legal action on the part of Congress. So this is, again, not the first time this has come up, but it, but it, is, it, is, an, it is an interesting issue that's coming up now. That clause, by the way, that necessary and proper clause has been used over the course of history and it is known as the elastic clause. And, and, and elastic is a perfect analogy because it has been stretched, I mean stretched, to allow for very, very, very big federal action depending on the mood of the climate, the, the, the country. Sometimes we're in a big government time, and so the last, that necessary and proper is stretched really, really, really big. Sometimes it snaps back, and we have a very, very small interpretation of congressional powers. Let me just give you an, a, a non-healthcare related example. Um, there was a law passed in the 90s, and forgive me, if I, but basically it said you can't carry an Uzi to a kindergarten. It was a law that said you can't carry weapons to public schools, and everyone thought this was a great law, but the question was, did the federal government overstep its jurisdictional limits in doing that? And because we were in a small government time, that law was, was, was invalidated. My understanding is immediately thereafter, all 50 states passed the same law. No one had a problem with the content, it was just where it was coming from. So that would be a small elastic clause, as opposed to when it's been very, very broad, such as I will show you in a minute as an example, ERISA is a great example of a very, very large elastic uh, expansion of the federal government. So this elastic clause has come and gone over the course of history. Here's what you need to know to be an informed observer. There really isn't a right answer. Nowhere is it written in stone whether the large interpretation or the small interpretation is accurate. It's always going to depend on who's sitting on the Supreme Court, what's the, the, the constituency of our, com our country, what is the public, where, where is the public on this. So yes, it comes and it goes. I always tell my students the, the nice thing about the elastic clause is if you are, you could be a big government person or you could be a small government person, the good news is you will be happy half the time because it is a very cyclical history how we have used this clause to expand and contract and then expand again our government. So that's really what we're looking at. How far can the government go? 
and, and the Supreme Court will weigh in on that, and they could weigh in on that differently. For example, the, the, the gun case that I just used as an example, that would have passed no problem in the 70s. It just depends on what's the current climate of the country. So we have this idea that the, here's the Supreme Court. We all know that sooner or later they're going to have to weigh in on this case. How are they likely to weigh on that very specific issue of the individual mandate to purchase insurance? Is that or is it not appropriate under the Commerce Clause as, again, viewed through this very elastic thing called the Necessary and Proper Clause? At the date of this recording, we've only had this Supreme Court give us one indication. Uh, it has nothing to do with health care, but it is interesting. I'll just read it. The Supreme Court gave a strong hint Monday, again, this is back in January 2011, that the justices are not anxious to rein in Congress's broad powers to pass regulatory laws under the Constitution's Commerce Clause, which is, again, the key component in the dispute over the pending court battles about the Affordable Care Law. By a 72 vote, which is almost, I mean, that's really unusual with this Supreme Court, but by a 72 vote, the justices turned down a constitutional challenge to a 2002 law by Congress, federal law, that made it a federal crime for a felon to have body armor or a bulletproof vest. Topic aside, you just get 7-2 is pretty conclusive that the only time they've weighed in on how, how broadly this Supreme Court's going to look at that very nebulous issue of elastic clause, that they gave it a big reading. Could have some interesting implications to the future, what, how they might see the next challenge or not. Again, there is no right answer. Many of us, and I'll admit, myself included, were naive enough to think that this was so important it was going to get fast-tracked. And everyone talked, at one point we were even, people, not that I ever got on this bandwagon, but there was people saying, oh, we don't need the appellate courts because it's going to have to go to the Supremes anyhow. Let's just go straight to the Supreme Court. It's not how our system works. We have a, it starts with the district court. It goes to the appellate court. We're getting a lot of good legal scholars on both sides to work through and refine the issues. We're again getting split opinions. Yes, the Supremes are going to have to see it, but the fast track, it's not going to be happening half as fast as many people had hoped it would. So the Supreme Court on Monday, this again is in August of 2011, uh, took no action. Uh, they had an opportunity to, 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 to grab the case, and they didn't take that opportunity because, again, it looks like there's some, let's just have this work through the normal process. Um, there's a law professor that came out, again, his protection looking at this, and I, I, I trust his opinion more than mine on this, is just saying that they, you just look at, and he's this, elite, this is, by the way, a biased opinion, the, he's a leading supporter of the health care law, but it said it looks like the U.S. Supreme Court's consideration of legal challenges to the overall might not occur until after the 2012 presidential election. And he said, he noted then, and again, this is August, that the administration has not yet appealed that 11th Circuit decision, the appeal necessary to get is moving forward. So he thought that that was kind of interesting. That opinion, by the way, was pretty much reinforced uh, just now in, uh, in September, um, September 12th, when again, it looks like they're in no hurry to move the health reform challenge to the Supreme Court, certainly in an election year. So the administration is described as being, again, in no hurry to have the Supreme Court weigh in. And again, that evidence for that is the Justice Department um, has, has sought and won actually an extension on, 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 on some of the appellate process. So we all know the Supreme Court's got to weigh in on this. And then in the meantime, we have some jockeying back and forth and various different courts answering, but we're all kind of holding our breath, which gets to the fun part of the program, because I want to go behind the curtain with you. I want to part the curtains. Remember the old scene in uh, um, uh, A Wizard of Oz, Ignore the Man Behind the Curtain? I want to bring you behind the curtain and show you a couple of interesting things while we're waiting that can help you as you interpret all the various different news reports that come out. The first thing I want to talk to you about is federal versus state jurisdiction. And this is so, this, this is why I have spent the last 20 years in health law. This is why I get 
like teary excited about health law. Not in the, my family thinks I'm a geek, and maybe I am, but it is this part of health law that makes it so endlessly fascinating on multiple issues as they come up over the years. And that is who's responsible for health care law? Where does the jurisdiction lie? So again, real quickly, we all remember from high school or wherever you learned it, that as a country, we came together as sovereign states under the Articles of Confederation, which did not work terribly well for the first 10 years during that process. They're trying to come up with some way, some central government. Everyone recognized that, yes, we have, we, we, we want to keep our sovereignty, but we also need some central government to deal with issues like interstate commerce, um, to deal with foreign affairs, to deal with uh, the military, etc. So we all understand that there was this, this, this giving up of sovereignty in order to create a federal government. But we certainly didn't give up all our sovereignty, and we all know that because I'm sure you closely identify with whatever state you live in or were born in, etc. So we have 50 sovereign governments with a constitution which makes this delineation between what's a federal issue and what's a state issue subject always to that ever-changing interpretation under the Elastic Clause, by the way. But here's the punchline. The police powers, the fundamental reason we have government as humans, whether we're talking about the Aztecs or the, or the Incas or uh, uh, Alabama, whoever we're talking about, the reason human beings created government in the first place was because at some level we recognize as humans that there had to be someone or something that would protect the health, safety, welfare, and morals of the populace. So those are collectively known as the police powers. The government is responsible for protecting the health, the safety, the welfare, and the morals of the populace. Morals is not always included. I include it. Most people do. Okay, take a look at that list. And if you are in healthcare, try to think of anything you do that is not related to the health, safety, welfare, or morals. That is healthcare. And here's what you gotta know no state ever gave up sovereignty over the police powers. Every state retained the police powers for their population. So Texas is responsible for the police powers in Texas, and Alabama, again, or Alaska, or Massachusetts, or Vermont, Georgia, wherever you are, health law is fundamentally a state issue. Um, so health care is a state-controlled issue. And this is why you have all those state laws, retention of medical records, or licensure of providers, or, or some of you still have certificate of need laws, whatever you have for your hospitals, your public health, your physicians, your nurses. Those are all state laws because we never gave that up as states. Medical malpractice, again, fundamentally a state issue. So you're in state court with a state judge using state case law and state evidentiary rules. Um, medical malpractice, again, state issue, licensure, safety, privacy. Every state before HIPAA had a law dealing with privacy as well. How you're paid, patient access. So what you have to understand is health care is fundamentally a state issue, and yet, I'm out two or three times a week speaking about federal law and how it impacts health care. How is that possible? There is no, there should technically be no federal law in the area of health care. And again, this is what keeps me going. I just think this is fascinating because although the jurisdiction belongs with the states, the reason why we have so much federal law, actually it's not a jurisdictional issue, it's about money. The reason the federal government got involved in health care is they became a pair and now a major pair, if not the major pair of health care in this country. And so when they started spending money, it gave them the option of also creating some rules. So a couple things about that. First of all, um, it's kind of like the analogy I like to use is if you have, chi if you have children, if you have school-age children, how do you get them to clean their room? Allowance. You don't clean your room, you don't get your allowance. That's, that is pretty much like the jurisdiction 
in quotation marks, that the federal government has over you. So for example, EMTALA, hey, you take our money, you gotta do it our way. Uh, HIPAA, uh, Stark, I mean, there's tons of laws which actually, if you look at the law, somewhere very early in the law, it will say, if you accept any federal funds, then here's how we want to do it. So it's kind of like, it's more of an allowance analogy than it is jurisdictional. Hey, you don't have to follow any, most of those laws. You just can't take any of their money. In fact, probably the happiest physician I have ever met, and, and uh, I'm, I'm married to a physician, daughter of a physician, granddaughter of a physician, so I can appreciate I may be having fun with this and the physicians often are not, but the happiest physician I ever met um, is working on the U.S. border, I will not say where, exclusively cares for illegal aliens, and there is no HIPAA, fraud and abuse, ERISA, or any of the other alphabet soup in his world, there's no federal fund, there's absolutely no government money. He's working for groceries, he's working for change, but he has no, there is no law that pertains to him, certainly federal law, because he's not taking any government money. But the point here is, it looks like the federal government is controlling health care. It is really a phenomena of how the money flows. So getting back to the Affordable Care Act, one of my favorite thing I hear people say is, well, that's not jurisdictional. Of course it's not jurisdictional. It's not even the right question to ask. Of course it's not jurisdictional. The question is, what can the government do in their, in their role as being, again, a major payer of health care? So kind of, again, something to put aside. Hold on to that thought too. Getting to that though, if, if you are accepting the money and as part of accepting the money, you have to play by their rules, then in the pencils for the pencil pushers, um, they can write pretty much, again, it's optional. You don't have to take their money, which again, of course, is not truly optional for most people, especially institutional providers, but hey, they can write their own rules. So, and I'll give you an example in a moment, but a lot of laws that actually never got passed, they still got what they wanted because administratively, through rules and regulations, they just write those rules in as being a condition for accepting the money. So most of the Affordable Care Act can be enforced administratively. In fact, is being administered administratively. A lot of these initiatives have already come way before any Supreme Court challenge because they're just written into the rules. So regardless of what happens in any political battle, re legislative recall, court challenge, next presidential election, when people say they can make this go away, you have to remember that the people behind the scenes writing the rules are putting that in as an administrative requirement and the chances, remember too, that a lot of these initiatives actually are very purple, if I may. They're not really Democrat or Republican initiatives. They're ideas that have been floated for a long, long time. So administrative versus legislative enforcement, another thing to be watching as you see what actually happens to the Affordable Care Act. So in the meantime, we just have to keep remembering that the rules attached to accepting federal funds, again, Medicare, Medicaid, TRICARE, CHIP, the list is pretty extensive. And even if you don't accept any government money, state or federal, remember that as Medicare goes, so goes the nation. Every initiative we've ever seen Medicare come up with has been adopted by private insurance companies, by self-insured, large self-insured employers, and we're seeing that already. Uh, things like the medical home model, very, very popular with self large self-insured employers, private medical model, et cetera. So just because, um, even if you can avoid the federal rules, those same rules, again, will become conditions for the, in the contracting with a lot of other payers. It's gonna be hard to avoid, is my point. So what I, I again, I, one of my, other things that I hear frequently when I'm out talking, and again, one of my favorites is someone says, well, that's not fair. That means all the details of this law are going to be written by non-elected bureaucrats. True. The reason I'm smiling is that's also true with every other law in your life. It's how our system is designed on both state 
and federal. So the law gets passed by the legislature, but it's always the bureaucrats in the cubicles. It's always all the thousands of people working within the administrative agencies and the federal government and the state government that actually put all that law into rules and regulations. So you may, I'm not saying it, I understand the upset, I just want to put it in perspective that that yes, it's not elected bureaucrats, yeah, and so is everything else too. So again, to make you an informed um, debater on this issue. And again, hold on to that thought because it gets even more fun. So with that as the background, I want to give you a very specific example that is in a much less political environment right now to show you how this actually works. And it's, it talk about strange bedfellows. And regardless of your opinion, you have to see the humor in this. Uh, I want briefly to talk to you about ERISA. I mentioned ERISA a moment ago, but ERISA came out in 1974, remember, big government. I mean, really big government back then. Everything was being interpreted very expansively in terms of the federal uh, responsibilities and rights in the area of legislation. So back in 1974, and there's always a story behind law, and it's always important to understand where laws come from because they're not just come out of whole cloth, thin cloth, air. So what was happening, and some of you are as old as I am and remember this, uh, there was a lot of bad press reports coming out where someone, especially minimum wage workers, they would work at the line year after year after year. They finally get to a, a retirement age and their employment benefits were gone. They'd been misappropriated, mishandled, embezzled, never invested. And there was plenty of news about how terrible it was for these people as they were reaching retirement age. And the public uproar was, there ought to be a law. I always tell my students, every time you hear people say, there ought to be a law, you better hold your breath because you're going to get one. What we got was the Ent Employment Retirement Income Security Act, ERISA. That's why it's named ERISA. And it was a, I mean, it's a great thing. It's like controlling that phenomena. And that, that's why it's named for retirement um, benefits. However, because we are in a really, really big government time in the 70s, they don't limit it to the government. What they decide is they're going to protect employee benefits. Most people are insured through their employers. So what happened is that all other benefits, including health care uh, and, and, and payment for health care, also falls under ERISA. And here's what in our day right now, looking at it is unbelievable, but with barely a squawk, they superseded all 50 state laws that conflicted with ERISA. Every state has laws about insurance and health care, but to the extent that these were ERISA employees, all the state laws that conflicted were with a stroke of a pen invalidated. So ERISA was a very, very large law. Now let me be clear, ERISA does not invalidate all state law for all employees. Um, you have to be an ERISA employee. Without going into, here's one easy test. If you are an employee of a self-insured employer, you are an ERISA employee. So uh, the, the, the GMs and the GEs and these huge big companies with a lot of employees uh, with ERISA, they all go under the ERISA umbrella as opposed to under state jurisdiction. Why do they supersede all those state laws, by the way? If I am a large corporation and I've got uh, locations in multiple states, the argument was, I don't want to have to follow 10 different state laws. Just give me one law about my, uh, my employment benefits, and that's going to make it easier to comply. So again, I don't think it was evil. It was just funny, given where we are now, thinking that Congress could get away with doing that. Anyhow, that's ERISA. 1974. Managed care is certainly on the horizon. The HMO Act was signed by President Nixon in 1973. So it's not that a managed care was unknown of, but it was certainly not prevalent. What happened to ERISA, which was very, very interesting, is as managed care got into its heyday, especially as it got into the 90s, those managed care plans 
were able to use ERISA as a shield against liability. So let me give you an example. Um, if I am a physician and I, let's say I want my patient to have, I, I want her to have a complete cardiac by, by a, a workup. I'm, a, I'm afraid she might have underlying cardiac disease. So I want her to have a complete cardiac workup. And she is, by the way, em, employed by a self-insured huge big corporation who is an ERISA client. So she's an ERISA patient. And I want her to have the, the, this fairly expensive workup. And her insurer slash employer says, no, 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 we're not going to pay for that. I, of course, tell her she still needs to have the test, but unfortunately, she can't afford it. She makes the decision not to get it, and she dies. I'm now getting sued because the estate doesn't believe that I practice great medicine, and they are now also suing Big Bad Wolf Insurance Company, who is the third party administrator for her employer. So, you know, Big Bad Wolf Insurance Company. So she's coming after me. Oh, and let's say it's, oh, I don't know, $16 million. I don't know. She's a huge, big CEO. There's all sorts of great stuff in this claim. So, wrongful death claim. So she is suing me in state law, again, state law, state court, state judge, state case law. However, Big Bad Wolf Insurance Company says, ooh, ERISA, no state law sticks to me. So not only are they not in state court, they're in federal court. However, it's more than that. Because what ERISA did, and again, it probably made sense in 1974, is they said that even if the patient is a successful or the plaintiff is successful in the lawsuit, their damages are limited to the amount of the benefit denied. So I'm on state court, $16 million claim, whatever it is. I know that's excessive, but we're whatever. That's what I'm facing as the doctor, while Big Bad Wolf Insurance Company is only subject to, at most, the amount that that cardiac evaluation would have cost, a couple thousand dollars. That's the ERISA shield. That is the managed care shield that has made people so crazy. Why are the rules so different? It's because of a law which arguably was never intended to say that and to have that impact. So again, it does not make benefits mandatory. Uh, it doesn't debate the substance of the plan, but it does say state laws don't apply to employment benefits for these employees and uh, we're going to protect the, co the, the cost by limiting the benefits, et cetera. Now, depending on where you live, you, there are, there's a town in Texas that has a very large local self-insured employer. 98% of that town is covered by that employer because either they work there or mom or dad work there. So 98% of that town are ERISA patients. We can have all the state laws we want, but they don't affect those patients because of this funny thing called ERISA. So, logical question would be, uh, could we get rid of that? A lot of, pay, uh, you can imagine healthcare, physicians, nurses, hospitals, executives, et cetera, saying, that's crazy, let's not have this shield for managed care. And from that is born something called the Patient Bill of Rights. Now, right now, we are in the middle of a fight about the Affordable Care Act. When I first started in health law back in the early 90s, this was a battle almost as uh, a, a explosive, by the way. There was about eight different versions of the Patient Bill of Rights um, being proposed, some by Republicans, some by Democrats, someone in the House, someone in the Senate, but everyone wanted to have a patient bill of rights. And I'll just pick one of those as an example. It looks pretty innocuous. This is the one that uh, Bill Clinton, who was then the president, was, uh, was supporting. You know, people have a right to accurate information. People have a right to a choice of providers and plans. People have access to emergency services. If they go to the emergency room thinking they're having a heart attack and it turns out it was only a, digest, a digestive problem, you still have to pay for that care. It's called the prudent layperson standard. Uh, it included people have a right to participate in their treatment decisions. They have a right to respect and non-discrimination. They have a right to confidentiality of healthcare information. 
and then they also have responsibilities too. Oh, excuse me, the complaints and appeals, they have a right to independent review, a rigorous internal review. It all gets into making a, a, your right to appeal adverse decisions on payment by your insurance company. And then as I started saying, and then of course they have responsibilities too, like they're supposed to pay you, tell you the truth, and have a healthy life. Nothing in that list, by the way, probably looks all that explosive, but here's what's not in the list, but was the key issue. Are we or are we not going to get rid of that managed care shield? So uh, this is what I was saying. Again, no available remedy for utilization decisions unless egregious. The, the, the damages are limited. No pain or dis, uh, death or disability, pain or suffering. That's what the, the fight was about. Half of the plans, Bill Clinton's plan included, said they wanted to get rid of the ERISA shield. Half of the proposals said, no, we can't afford to get rid of that managed care shield. It was such an explosive issue, by the way, that for four years running, one body of Congress or the other, either the House of Representatives or Senate, four years running passed one side or the other year after year after year, but it was such an explosive issue of are we going to get rid of that managed care shield that we could not, it was a very, very divisive issue. I'll tell you how divisive it was. We all unfortunately remember September 11th, uh, September 11th and the horrific things that happened that day. I'm hoping you also all remember September 12th because on September 12th, Every member of the House of Representatives and the Senate of both parties got on the front steps of Congress and they stood there united and they said, look, we may have our disagreements, but we're a family here like siblings fight. Don't pick on us. We stand united. It was really a beautiful, beautiful moment. It didn't unfortunately last a long, long time, but it was a really great moment. But in that spirit, they took, my memory is it was three bills off the floor because they were so divisive. They knew they couldn't go back into the conversation without all that unity splitting apart. And believe it or not, the Patient Bill of Rights was one of them. It was that explosive at the time. Were we or were we not going to get rid of the managed care shield? So it was actually formally died afterwards, but really it died on 9-11 in a spirit of unity. So as you hear this, you might be wondering, is that managed care shield still in place? You bet it is. It's been nibbled at along the edges by the courts ultimately, but yeah, it's still there. So wouldn't you love to, isn't that a state's rights issue? How could you invalidate all state laws? And again, the reason I've done this is for the best punchline I can give you. And that is health law makes for strange bedfellows. So you have to get, that 20 years ago, there was a party arguing this is absolutely inappropriate. Congress overstepped its bounds. Healthcare is fundamentally a state's rights issue. You've got to get rid of ERISA so that states can control healthcare in their states. And if I asked you which party said that, you probably, given our current debate, would think it was the Republican Party. It was not. It was the Democratic Party was falling on its sword, teary-eyed over the state's rights violations that ERISA proposed. It was the Republican Party that were equally as vehement about how important it was to maintain ERISA because, by the way, they were worried about small business in the manufacturing industry and in the, the Chamber of Commerce, et cetera. So they were vehemently arguing that it's absolutely appropriate for Congress to supersede all state law and take on an issue as important as health care. If you can't see the humor in this, again, regardless of your opinion on the Affordable Care Act, but sometimes I'm watching the television and I see a politician who's been around 20 years, I see their lips move, I have to fall out of my chair. They are saying exactly the opposite of what they did 20 years ago. So again, the, the, a, a pox on both parties here. It's just really, really interesting how similar the issues are and how diametrically opposed the two Two major parties are on their response. So yeah, healthcare, it's fun. It's fun to watch healthcare law. 
By the way, one other point before I leave Orissa. If you go back and look at the Bill Clinton Bill of Rights, and I told you it never passed. None of the Bill of Rights did pass because of that very, very contentious issue. I want you to go through those eight points and notice something. It gets back to my point about administrative versus legislative uh, rulemaking. Every single one of those eight components was ultimately passed. It just got written into the rules or incorporated in another law. For example, the whole thing about confidentiality, that was the precursor of HIPAA. So again, when we look at our current law and the debate, people say it's going to go away. Not so likely. It's likely to come up, again, rulemaking, a future law, whatever. It's just health law is not half as uniform as uh, uh, certainly the, the uh, TV news would make you think. Um, at the end of the day, again, this is what makes health law fun for me as a lifelong uh, profession and passion. Uh, the politics of medicine, uh, you've got to admit, they're, they're, they're frustrating, but you have, I hope you see the humor. I will leave you with one of my favorite quotes um, about the politics of health care. Um, the quote is, if you don't fix it and I don't do it, one of these days you and I are going to spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once, once was like in America when men were free. Sounds like it could have come out of a lot of political talking heads right now in this debate, but actually the quote is from uh, Ronald Reagan before he became president and the topic he's talking about is Medicare. So it's always a rock and rolling ride when we're talking about when politics and law and health care get combined. And for some of us, at least, that uh, is endlessly entertaining and, and interesting. So again, by way of conclusion, I don't know if you're right now thinking that it's nirvana and everything's going to get better or that we're about to be completely destroyed. What, however this view is of you, for you, I, I hope that this gives you some, some real information or some actual background legally to be informed observers of what is a very important process. At the end of the day, if you're in healthcare, regardless of what happens to any challenge or any uh, future legislative action, if you are focusing on quality, accuracy, patient satisfaction, education from a neutral source, good luck. If nothing else, get uh, perspectives from both sides of an argument and then make your own decision. Network in your community. That's where we're headed, again, regardless of what happens to this particular law. I would like to leave with one less and not funny argument at all. People are scared half to death. There's especially the elderly community. So please, 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 we can have our political debates. At the end of the day, I think it's very, very important that our patients know you're going to be there. You're going to take care of them. It's really, it's, it's not going to be the end of the world for them. And if nothing else, if there was ever a time for leadership and direction and, and, and well-educated voices in a very important conversation, this is it. So good for you for being physician leaders and, and, and taking time for additional education with programs such as this one. I wish you nothing but the best. I, I thank ACPE for giving me the opportunity to present this to you because I do think it's such an interesting moment in our history. I wish you nothing but the best regardless of what happens in the outcome. I hope that you will continue to enjoy uh, your field, your, your, your profession, and, uh, and healthcare. Thank you. It's been my pleasure.